I want to introduce you to uh, the Army Research Laboratory and uh, talk to you about some of the things we do and give you some perspective about ARL. I don't know how many of you know uh, about ARL, so let me spend a little time about uh, introducing the laboratory. And then I'll, I'll talk about flexible displays, the flexible display center that's at uh, Arizona State University. And then we'll talk a little bit about where we're going in the future and why we're probably most importantly why we're going where we're going in the future. So, you know, here's the obligatory mission statement, right? This is the Army Research Lab. So we are the research laboratory for the United States Army. Uh, our mission statement is really about discovery, innovation, and then transition. So we do basic and applied research as I'll define for you, but uh, we're also about transition. You know, the reason the Army has a, has a laboratory uh, the reason why this work is done within the government and not necessarily done with the universities is, uh, exclusively is because we want to transition to our ultimate customer capabilities, technologies uh, for national security and for uh, the warfighter uh, as quickly and as uh, efficiently as we can. So we like to say discovery, innovation, transition. Uh, my new boss put this, uh, Tom Russell put this tagline down below, making today's army and the next army obsolete. When I first read that, I went, what do you mean we're going to make the army obsolete? That doesn't quite sound right to me. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue. But the way he describes it is you really want to make sure you understand the threat environment uh, that the United States Army is going to face going forward. And then understanding the threats that are out there, how do you change technology, how do you bring technology to bear on that threat space as if uh, you were fighting with the next, uh, the, the future force. So that's a little bit of motherhood. Uh, here's a little bit, of more, little bit more motherhood. You don't have to pay attention to all the acronyms on this chart. You will find plenty of acronyms in this, on this uh, presentation. So if uh, you see one, you know, there are only 26 letters in the alphabet, right? There, there are more acronyms than letters, so we get redundant, right? So if you see something that you don't understand, just, just raise your hand. I'm happy to answer. But uh, the point that I want to make with this chart is that uh, under the Army's Materiel Command, uh, which is the big command the Army has for buying all the stuff the soldiers use and all the stuff you see out in the field. Uh, of, you, of that uh, research, uh, the Army's Material Command does 72% of it across the Army. The rest of it is done by the Medical Command, by the Corps of Engineers, who, whom I'm sure many of you have uh, heard about in the news from time to time, uh, and other areas. But what you understand is there's a large body of research that happens within uh, the Army Research and Development Command. And I thought I'd give you a little bit of sense of, of how we're structured. So as I said, ARL is the corporate, basically the corporate research laboratory for the Army. So we're doing discovery, we're doing innovation. And then as, along with, with ARL, there are all of these other engin more engineering centers. So their job is to really mature the technology, get it work out the engineering bugs and get it to the point where it can be fieldable. And it goes across the gamut of technology from, uh, from uh, aviation and missiles to, uh, to projectiles to communications and electronics and sensors to chemical biological warfare to soldier for the sensors to large vehicles, TARDEC, which is actually here in Michigan. Um, so I like this chart because it kind of describes the research that's done across all of these Army, and the whole Army enterprise, if you will, from a science and technology perspective. And so, you know, if you think about this in terms of percentage of dollars, ARL uh, is really heavily invested in, in discovery, right? So the discovery of new science and then the innovation piece, which we like to define as the application of science. Some of you may know the lingo, the budget activity lingo. This is a really 6.1, 6.2 research, if, you, if you're familiar with that. But think about it really in terms of discovery and innovation. And we're more on the innovation side, the application side of science, than we are on the discovery side. But as I mentioned, um, the RDX do a lot of engineering. So you might, you might expect to see a lot of advanced development, advanced prototypes, production engineering and then ultimately support to the warfighter. And then the PMs, PEOs, 
Uh, those, are the guy, those are the guys that do the buying. So that's where most of the dollars reside. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, maybe students are not interested in this, but some of the professors might be interested in this, that this is kind of the, the business model. This is the money that uh, the Army Research Laboratory has. So this is your tax dollars at work. Well, for those of you that are actually working and not just studying and doing slave research labor, but uh, this is the business model. So you can see kind of how we're broken out in terms of the 6-1 budget carried. So that's based the basic science. 6-2, that's, uh, that's the applied. And some of these other budget categories. Uh, we have a very uh, interesting small business initiative. Uh, we get customer money, which we call reimbursable. And what I want to point out is just the breadth of technology in the investment space that you see uh, all of this funding going through. So this is done in percentages, but it's about $1.3 billion of, uh, of annual uh, funding. And uh, so there's a lot in basic research, and a lot of that money goes straight out. On the other side, the blue, that's, that's the, how the money is spent. So you can see 11% of our, of our dollars are, are directly uh, to uh, academia. Uh, we have the UARCs, the collaborative alliances. That's all uh, in collaboration with universities. So the MAST, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the MAST. CTA that uh, is here at Michigan, that's part of that collaborative alliance bin. We do quite a bit of in-house research, so there's 40% for us, and then you can see where the rest of the money goes. So that's kind of the space spread out through, you know, the classic disciplines, if you will. Lots of material science, lots of physical sciences, uh, information science. You know, we're the Army, so we have to be interested in ballistics and aeromechanics and things like that. So, and even the human sciences. Uh, are ongoing at uh, ARO. Just a little bit more, last chart I think on organization. This is the whole kit and caboodle. You can tell that um, this, this organization chart came from the corporate headquarters by the size of the boxes for everybody that's in headquarters. So Dr. Russell is the new director of ARL. He came uh, just recently from AFOSR. That's the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And then down below that you can see all of uh, sort of the business units at the, uh, at the college or directorate level. So, and I've got the uh, sensors and electron devices directorate, but then as, as you can see, we go across computational survivability and, and lethality. That's understanding vulnerability of, of army equipment and the like, human resources, vehicles, et cetera. Okay, just a, one more motherhood, I'm sorry. So this is my, uh, my uh, business unit, if you will, this is our objective. We're, we're heavily vested in sensors and specialty electronics, power and energy. Uh, electronic warfare, you can, you can read the kind of the things we're most interested in from a technology standpoint. And those are really, in the, in the black and yellow, those are the, that's the mission space we are most uh, 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 invested in. And uh, we spend a lot of our energy thinking about applications and solutions to affect those problems that are most interesting and important to the, to the U.S. military. This blue box on, the le on, uh, on my right here, critical mass of Army-focused scientists, engineers, and technicians. I just want to highlight that very briefly because I, I like to tell people that, um, you know, when you work for the Army Research Laboratory, it's a little different than working at a university in terms of the amount of unfettered research you can do. Even at the most fundamental discovery phase of the research we do, we want to be thinking about how, these, how this technology is eventually going to solve an Army problem. If we aren't working on Army problems, then we really don't want to necessarily work in that space. So even at the most fundamental research, I want people to think about how this would impact the U.S. Army and the soldier, more importantly. So that's kind of motherhood. A uh, little bit of the big picture of the laboratory. I'm just I'm going to shift gears now and, and talk about uh, flexible electronics for the Army. So, this is kind of the, the space, right? So you think about the soldier at, at the center of, of what we do, everything we do. Uh, so here's some of the things we're most interested in, uh, in this space. So one of the things the Army, more so than the Navy or the Air Force, are concerned about is uh, in that central box, it says reduce swap C. So swap C is size, weight, power, and probably most importantly, cost. The Army, the Air Force and the Navy will tell you we don't necessarily care about costs because they have lots of money. Well, we have lots of soldiers. You know, we have to worry about shoelaces, toothpaste, 
uniforms, a lot of the money that the Army has goes toward just maintenance of, of equipment and maintenance uh, and care and feeding of our troops. So even at the research level, we have to worry about cost. And so we don't want to think about technology solutions that will never be cost effective. For us, that's just a waste of time and money. Size, weight, and power, you can imagine the soldier with all the kit he's got to carry on him. Uh, size, weight, and power is, is paramount. Uh, we want to minimize that. So that's kind of where the flexible uh, electronics and the flexible display effort within the Army was born, was to think about ways that you could get information on the soldier, get a display on the soldier, and get it on him in a, in a way that was first usable, uh, secondly affordable, and uh, more importantly, a low weight and, uh, and, and, uh, and flexible. So I want to just put a little bit of, uh, you know, sort of definition in terms of where the space is uh, in what we're talking about when we say flexible electronics, and in particular, flexible displays. So this chart uh, on the abscissa talks about transistor mobility, and on the ordinate is about frequency. So you can think about this as switching speeds and what applications you might take advantage of if you're going to use uh, a, a flexible electronic material. So uh, it's kind of listed out in terms of mobility. You'll see it in the green box, that's really the space we're going to talk about today. And this is the amorphous silicon thin film transistor. And so it has a limited mobility. And therefore, the, because it's amorphous silicon, uh, it, the features, the applications that it uh, is most applicable to are limited. But it works very, very well for uh, display technology and for sensing technology. So as you move uh, forward in mobility and you start to reduce the design rules associated with the processing of uh, this technology, you can kind of see the trend, right? Everyone knows about uh, polysilicon and then, of course, single crystal CMOS. And so here's just sort of an, a, a listing of some of the applications that, uh, that you might see as, you, as mobility goes up and how the frequency changes. And ultimately, there are emerging, there's emerging technology, graphene and other technologies, where we'd like to get uh, the, the highest mobility to be able to use it at the highest frequencies in the smallest form factor. But for this talk, I just want to tell you that I'm going to focus on that green box, because that's where this, this early flexible technology in, in uh, displays uh, and large area sensors was aimed at. So here are the two big innovations. Uh, that uh, were started early on. The first was uh, large area flexible displays. And the key innovation, which, you know, this center has been going on for about 10 years now, so, but, the, but in uh, 2004, what we needed was a large active area matrix uh, of thin film amorphous silicon on a plastic substrate. And so that was, that was what was missing to do large area displays. So uh, the center was started at Arizona State and um, to be able to do that. So you can see just very briefly how these things work. Um, you've got you know, organic light emitting diodes. You've got a plastic substrate that have thin film transistors that are arranged into their active transistors so you can do your switching actively. But again, because the mobilities are so low, this is really the only um, switching speeds that you can handle are really at the display level. You know. um, but if you go down to the next, uh, box there, that's really about flexible large area sensing arrays. And in this case, we're talking about digital x-ray displays. So x-rays in general lend themselves to large area sensing, right? If you think about mammography, if you're thinking about any other radiography, you really want a, as large a sensor as you possibly can get your hands on. So here's an example in this bottom box that uses a scintillator material, uh, gadolinium uh, oxysulfide that's been uh, turbidium uh, uh, doped, that uh, x-rays come in, electron hole, hole pairs are generated, they recombine, this material fluoresces in the visible, then you put a pin photodiode underneath that, you put an array of pin photodiodes underneath that to collect that visible energy and then you read it out. So you can see where you could make a very large area display using this, which you couldn't necessarily make in silicon. So this is much larger than uh, a silicon wafer might necessarily be, right? We, we, I'm going to show you that this is over four, you can get 14, 15 inch kinds of displays and sensors out of this material um, with the process that's been developed. 
Let me see if this will change. Well, so it never fails, right? As many times as we, oh, there it comes. It's on your display. Oh, okay, so there's a movie there. I don't know if you'll see it, but. So um, very briefly though, I think what, what's happening is, uh, you know, we started this center 10 years ago, and when we did, we saw a real need for these flexible displays uh, and this large area sensing. Uh, we forgot about two things, or we didn't see two things coming, right? The first was Gorilla Glass, right? One thing you might think about with a flexible display is it's flexible, right? So you can drop it, bend it, crinkle it, move it around. You know, back in the day when this was started, displays weren't, uh, weren't so flexible, right? So that was one of the reasons why we wanted to have it. You could put, give this to a soldier. Uh, soldiers uh, are heavy-handed by design. Uh, so, you know, they, they don't necessarily take good care of their equipment, but you want something that's rugged and durable. So flexibility was key. Uh, but along comes gr Gorilla Glass, along comes other innovations, along comes the ability to do touch display, on, uh, d touch modes on your display, which this, uh, this flex displays can't do right now. And so uh, you can see limited application, but, you know, I think the next big opportunity uh, is really in flexible electronics. Uh, so CMOS on flexible substrates, so how do you do that, right? If you think about the way uh, things are currently done in printed flex, uh, it's with geometric uh, uh, inno innovation, really, of the ability to bend uh, signal I.O. in and around things. But the future, I think, is really in this capability to do very, very thin single crystal silicon on plastic substrates and to be able to bend uh, full up microprocessors with all the mobility that uh, you might expect to see in single crystal. So you're going to hear from Sology right after me. So you'll see some really good printed technology, I think, coming down the road. There's some interesting work that's come uh, out of Illinois, and there's a company funded by, named MC10 by, uh, by uh, John Rogers. All of this is moving away from amorphous silicon necessarily to single crystal, but on very, very thin uh, silicon substrates uh, mounted onto plastic. And that's really the next trend, and that'll be the next push uh, going forward. But here's a little bit on application from the Army's perspective and the military's perspective in general, where we think large area sensors, which is really large area electronics, are going to go. And you can kind of see some of the space that we're most interested in. Where could you take advantage of large area sensors? So I mentioned X-ray detectors. There are other things you might want to detect, gammas and neutron radiation for, for uh, reasons. Uh, combinatorial detection, so being able to put assays of different uh, uh, sensing material and do it, looking at combinatorics to understand and identify chemicals and other uh, nasty substances. Uh, you could think about visible or, or near-infrared optical imaging where you'd like to have uh, visible blankets, large area blankets that you could use to cover surfaces. And then if you wanted to do acoustic sensing, you could, you could use this technology to, to make a transducer that you could then read out. Down in the lower left, you see uh, the first uh, buildable, uh, or very large, world's largest flexible display. You can see it's quite flexible. One of the drawbacks with this technology is you'll notice he's only bending it in one direction. If we were to try to bend it, in the orthogonal direction, he'd break it. Yet the problem with the technology is that you have to have interconnects to read out the data. So those interconnects are not necessarily flexible. So that's one of the issues. But you know, when we thought about this initially, it was about being able to roll it up like a map. So you might only necessarily need to roll it, unroll it in one direction. You have limited flexibility in the other direction. So um, now onto the center very quickly. So, we have this flex display center that was established to really try to push this technology. You know, when we first started in 2004, there was a lot of work going on in organic light emitting diodes. There was some work going on in flexible uh, substrates for those diodes, but not a, wa a lot. And what the Army saw was if you uh, look in the center, you see an example of a flexible display that a soldier could wear on his wrist to be part of the, uh, the information and the situation awareness package that you might want to give soldiers. So this was established to develop materials and processes. Um, 
it was there to enable displays and, and these large area arrays. We were going to do limited demonstrations. And then really to, th to think about a jump start of a, of a new way to do business between the Army, the government, and private uh, partnerships to combine uh, not only ac academics, but also manufacturing uh, resources and small businesses as well. So here's the business model. There's a lot, there are a lot of words on this chart, but let me just say that this is a very unique center. It's a cooperative agreement between the Army and Arizona State University. As I mentioned, it's been going on for 10 years. Uh, it's really about not only discovery, but also innovation, uh, application of science, and to try to get a supply chain within the country uh, for this flexi these flexible displays when it was first started. There was a significant cost share by Arizona State University in this program. They, they have cost share the facilities, the equipment, operations. There's actually ASU staff uh, that's there full time in the facility right now. Uh, and then there was a big push to get uh, industrial partners involved. So industrial partners come, they pay a yearly fee. It's either in research or yeah, as, it, as in kind in research or, or cash. Universities could basically join for free uh, without a fee. Uh, and then the projects would be sort of voted on uh, with the membership at the board of directors level. The Army always had veto rights, you know, because uh, we're the Army, we, it's our money, we get to veto. Uh, projects are agreed upon, as I mentioned. Now, what was real struggle here, and I'm just going to highlight on it for time, but what was a real struggle was the intellectual property agreements that were needed to set this center up. Who owned the IP? This probably took several years to work through initially. I think it it was two years before when we first initiated the project when the project was actually uh, kicked off. Uh, but well, you can read the, the way the intellectual property finally uh, fell out. So a couple of things. Ownership follows the inventor, not the center. So you think about bringing uh, univer another university in or a small company in. If they had any pre-existing intellectual property, it's theirs. Right? So one of the things that companies were, were quite scared of and a lot of the principals were afraid of is if I come into this center and I start to process on these flexible device, on these flexible substrates, does all my former IP have to go with it? And uh, a lot of people were nervous about that, particularly ASU. Uh, so that had to be uh, worked through. So no access to background IP. Uh, Co-inventions, if, if a partner and, the Ares and ASU work together on something, they would both hold the rights to, uh, to the patent. Uh, if uh, ASU worked on it alone, they would have, ex you know, ASU would have exclusive rights. But in all of this, there's government purpose rights, uh, always unlimited. And then uh, what was kind of very interesting and quite unique is that even if ASU developed the, the technology innovation, then the members of this consortium would have uh, the ability to get first use rights before it uh, entered into the public domain. So 18 months of, of that. And then here are the participants in the center right now. Uh, you can see it's sort of divided up. I don't know what it is with, uh, with these, uh, these shapes, but uh, you know, we've got tool sets for manufacturing. Uh, so tool makers, manufacturers and display technology folks, material uh, people. DuPont uh, has a lot of innovation in this area for the plastic substrate. Uh, university. Uh, uh, collaborators and then most importantly you know is industry I always like to say that you know the Army Research Laboratory we don't make stuff we, we apply science we do basic fundamental research but we don't make a product we have got to partner with industry to get our, our uh, capabilities ultimately to the war fighters so it's very important to bring industry and university researchers along with us I spent a lot of time on that before I ever showed you what the center is. So this is the center. Um, and uh, it is a substantial investment. Uh, it has a, a Gen 2, which is what uh, commercial manufacturers are basically producing uh, large, large scale uh, organic light emitting diodes, AMLCD technology. All of that technology that you're, you're seeing on your laptops and, and the like are coming out of uh, Gen 2 uh, fabrication lines in, in Korea and in China. So uh, this is very important that this technology could directly interface to that uh, technology uh, model, that fabrication model. So 
here's what goes on. The secret sauce is, and most of the innovation is in this bonding, debonding tool. You can see it starts with a ceramic substrate where a PETN is, is uh, laid down on top of it. And you can see him doing the lift off there. And this is, once this, this is a lot, there was a lot of research here to understand the adhesion, uh, understand how this, the effects of temperature, uh, understand the material properties in general. But once that was done, this is basically a liftoff process. So you, you literally just take a, an X-Acto knife, slide it down the edge, and you can peel off uh, uh, that, uh, subs that, uh, well, that flexible substrate, which on that particular device has large area uh, sensors for x-rays on it. So the bond debond is really uh, the secret sauce of this particular technology. There's a, there is a competing technology that uh, is done in industry. It's called EPLAR, which is uh, a laser relief. They start with, uh, with silicon. They put uh, a, a polyimid on top of that. They put a glass, polyimid, imid, and then they use a laser lift off to take the substrate off, the flexible substrate off the glass. Um, but again, nothing uh, this size. So Gen 2 technology can go from, as you see, over 14 inches uh, in, uh, in uh, width. So quite impressive. Very good photoresist facilities, as you might imagine, photolithography, deposition and etching, and the ability to do uh, OLED, organic light emitting diode uh, material deposition as well. All in the same facility. Uh, it's got class 100. I think over 20,000 square feet of class 10 space. And again, uh, anyone can really use this facility. Uh, and if, uh, from an academic standpoint, if you've got an idea, if you have a, something you want to try on, this, on these substrates, we can uh, talk about ways that the, the center can support that activity. Uh, it's been in existence for 10 years. Um, one of the things that uh, people like to talk about is uh, metrics, and this is a measure uh, in terms of papers that have been published as a result of the center. This, is, this graph is, is not the best quality, so I apologize for that. But you can see in the late uh, 80s, there was a lot, of, a lot of work at DARPA in particular on flexible displays and most importantly, organic light emitting diodes. So um, on the left-hand side is uh, our papers uh, that are directly related to flexible displays. On the right-hand side is the number of papers that are related to uh, OLED research in general. We can see the trend in terms of research papers. Uh, you know, there wasn't a ramp up until, the, until uh, DARPA started to put some serious money into organic light emitting diodes in the late 90s, early 2000s. Then the display center was awarded in, uh, in uh, 2004. And as a result, you can see the trend in OLEDs, uh, they pretty much stayed on the same uh, trend over the years, but there is a, a, an increase if you were to just plot a straight line on that curve, you'd see that the number of uh, flex display papers have started to take off at a different slope. Uh, and then sort of late in 2010, um, in Korea, there was a 300 plus million dollar flexible OLED line that was, uh, that was announced. Uh, and they still have not, Samsung has, uh, has announced flexible displays for cell phones, but they're having some trouble. There's another problem with this technology that people don't like to talk about in that it's hydrophilic, so it really doesn't uh, do well in water. So, you know, you have to encapsulate it. If you can't encapsulate it, then, you, you know, you don't have a, a good working display. So usually you got to put a piece of glass on top of it, and then it's not flexible anymore. So what? anyway, these are some of the things I wrestle with. So I'm a new director. I've been in my position for five months, and I'm still kind of trying to understand my way through this space. And so these are the questions I'm asking myself. But what's interesting about this trend is you'll notice that the number of papers have dropped off. And what that tells you is that this has gone, particularly for the flexible OLEDs, this has come out of the pre-competitive stage. People are starting to talk about competitive technologies now, and therefore the number of papers, particularly at the industrial uh, research facilities, are dropping. And you'll see that, you'll see that more and more as uh, money starts to uh, be made. So here's a, a collection of, of world-class results, some firsts that have come out of the center. Uh, it is being licensed by a couple of different companies, uh, and we're continuing to negotiate uh, for several others. ARL in-house research has been predominantly focused on uh, organic light emitting diode uh, material, so there have been a number of uh, firsts coming out of our 
organization. You can see the number of industry partners. Uh, you can see that uh, there's been quite a bit of university work as well. Uh, 20 faculty, 80 plus students, patents, peer-reviewed papers. Uh, you know, I, I, I said that uh, we don't do this, we don't invest government money, we don't think about Army problems or, or Army technology unless there are Army solutions that we're trying to solve, or Army problems we're trying to solve. Excuse me, so you can see some of the first uh, applications that the Army is interested in, and I've talked about this quite a bit now. So, but the first thing you're going to see, uh, we've already demonstrated this uh, flexible display for soldier wearability. Uh, there's some question whether or not the Army is actually going to purchase that. There are other, as you might imagine, other competing display uh, solutions. But I think the first thing we're really going to have success with is this very large, flexible X-ray uh, sensor, which uh, might be very useful for trying to look for hidden explosives and things like that. So I'm going to stop there and just wrap it up. Uh, you know, it's a very successful center. It's been going on for 10 years. Uh, we're probably going to continue our investment for one or two more years. And then Arizona University or ASU will be sort of on their own with this center. Uh, and, uh, you know, it continues to look for investment. I think from a research uh, perspective, there is plenty of opportunity there still for innovation. Uh, I'm looking for applications. So if you guys have good applications where you think that this technology will solve Army problems, uh, I would be willing to talk to you about funding. Uh, but again, I, I mentioned this uh, X-ray imaging will be the first uh, real uh, application transition, if you will, that'll come out of the center. And uh, I just want to leave you with, with this one parting thought, is that if you're going to think about technology to solve Army problems, you have to think about size, weight, power, and cost. Even at the discovery level, the most basic research if you want it to work for, for Army applications, you have to think about that space. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think maybe take a couple of questions. Or... Uh, this is called the Solo Robot. This is the one that we uh, presented to the President when, it, when he came. And uh, this is a completely autonomous inspection device that's used in the most common size.